नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स सो फाइनली वी हैव कम टू द लास्ट सेशन ऑफ अवर कोर्स ऑन मैन्युफैक्चरिंग गाइडलाइंस फॉर प्रोडक्ट डिजाइन एंड एज यू आर वेल अवेयर दैट व्हाट वी हैव कवर्ड इन द कोर्स इज नाउ इन योर कोर्ट मींस एवरी इंफॉर्मेशन दैट हैज बीन कवर्ड इज विद अवेलेबल विद ऑल द लर्नर्स दिस इज द लास्ट सेशन and we have decided that in the last session we will try to summarize we will try to finalize that what all we have learnt and what kind of information is available we have taken glimpses from the various sessions so that as a concise form we are able to produce maybe one particular session which can act as a guideline for learners who are just listening to this particular session for our learners who have registered for the course and who have undergone all the sessions maybe this session may not seem that relevant but sometimes there are sessions maybe this session can have a stand alone viewers also the viewers who are only listening to this particular session so this session will act as a guideline will act as a source of very very concise very very brief very very clear cut information that what kind of information is available what kind of databases are available what kind of guidelines are available what kind of rules and regulations are available emphasizing on the manufacturing perspectives when the product is being designed and if you remember in the very first session of our course we have seen that the product design process what we have seen there when we analyze the product during the design process we try to focus on four important analysis or four important characteristics now what are these four important points the first one is the marketing aspects the second is the product characteristics in terms of the functional aspects operational aspects durability and dependability aspects as well as the aesthetic aspects the third broad analysis point is the economic analysis or the economic aspects and fourth is the production aspects so when we are designing a product we have to analyze it from four important aspects and out of which our focus primarily is on the manufacturing or the production aspects of the product and therefore the title of the today's session which is a summary session for this course on manufacturing guidelines for product design is product design from the manufacturing perspective that when we are analyzing our product that how it is going to be manufactured what are the various guidelines that we must keep in mind what are the important factors that are in going to influence the manufacturability of our product that is basically what we are going to cover today we will try to take a case study also in which we can see that if we redesign the part maybe to at get the same type of functions to get the same type of operational aspects but maybe the product may become lightweight the product may become easy to assemble the product may become easy to disassemble the product may become easy to maintain easy to service so there can be advantages accrued across various dimensions so we can get different types of advantages whereas the product is definitely satisfying the functional scope for which the product has been designed so we will try to take one case study also in today's class so maybe let us start revising our course in totality so we can see that we have tried to classify the various manufacturing processes now you can see on your screen only one term is coming that is the manufacturing processes so the learners who have gone through this course must be able to emphasize that how we can classify the various manufacturing processes and for new learners i will just click and show what are the various processes now the various processes can broadly be classified into six categories and these are the processes which we have seen in the very beginning maybe during the first week of our, our discussion on this course on manufacturing guidelines so basically we can have the primary forming processes as you can see on your screen the primary forming processes and in our course our focus primarily has been on casting which is sand casting and die casting also we have seen injection molding 
compression molding for plastics so we have seen the primary forming processes what are the various guidelines we will quickly revise maybe one or two guidelines for each of these processes then we have seen the material removal processes in this we have seen the machining process what are the design guidelines for machining and if you remember we have also seen the hole making operations also so we have seen that how to design a product what must be the distance between the two holes what must be the distance between the hole and the edge of the plate where the hole has to be made so all that we have covered in the material removal processes similarly deforming is another category of the processes and we have not much focused on the deformative processes but in joining our focus has been on a large number because most of the products again i am coming to the example of the video camera there are so many parts which have been assembled together so even the most simplest of part if i take about example of my pen there are still four or five different sub parts which have been assembled together to make this simple product so for making this simple product we have seen how the various assembly operations are required when we open it there are there is a gripping mechanism here and which is coming coming and fitting here with this click so this is one joining technique it is maybe a screw type of fastening arrangement here so we have a joining technique here also then this metallic part is fixed here at the top so for a simple product also we can see so much of joining strategies are required so for a very very complicated product there are different types of joining strategies that are required so joining and fabrication we have seen and we have tried to list down the guidelines for welding we have tried to list down the guidelines for riveting for mechanical fastening then for plastics we have seen uh, different processes like induction welding we have seen vibration welding we have seen ultrasonic welding so different processes related to joining have been seen then we have also seen another process which is microwave joining of materials so different pro processes we have tried to cover in the overall summary of this course or in the overall domain of this course so primarily the processes can be divided as primary forming processes material removal processes deforming processes joining or fabrication processes finishing and surface treatment processes and bulk property enhancing processes such as the heat treatment so this is a broad classification of the processes whatever we have covered in the course very broadly is listed here then coming to the six categories which can be further subdivided into two categories what are these conventional and unconventional processes so specifically for joining we have seen that welding mechanical fastening adhesive joining are simple processes conventional processes then maybe the microwave joining of materials can be clubbed as a unconventional process and in between we have ultrasonic welding induction welding vibration welding so these can be in between the two not very conventional but not very advanced also so we have tried to cover broad categories in primary form forming if you remember casting is one process where we melt the metal and then we pour it into the mold to get a desired shape of the product in sand casting process similarly we have seen a process called rapid prototyping in which we are able to produce a product or a prototype by maybe diffusing the powder or maybe depositing the material layer by layer like in case of laminated object manufacturing powdered material is sintered in selective laser sintering sometime liquid photopolymer is cured to get a final product in case of rapid prototyping strategies so those are also falling as a advanced form of primary forming processes that is rapid prototyping which we have already covered in this course in the last week that is the 8th week so these are the this is a summary of the manufacturing processes that we have covered we have seen the guidelines for most of these processes then we have focused on materials also how these can be classified we have seen with these can be classified as metals ceramics polymers and composites so within metals we can have ferrous metals non ferrous metals in ferrous metals we can have iron steel non ferrous aluminum copper zinc 
similarly for composites naturally occurring composites and artificial composites metal matrix composites ceramic matrix polymer matrix naturally we can have wood and human bones or maybe the bones similarly for polymers and ceramics so we have tried to list down or explain or discuss the processes for different types of materials. So, if you can see that there is a wide variety of combinations possible. Now, there is a long list of manufacturing processes, there is a long list of engineering materials and when we combine these two together we are getting a complete table that which process can be used for which type of material and for that we have this summary table. This is also available on the NPTEL uh, website. So, applicability of different manufacturing processes to different types of engineering materials. So, we can see A means widely used, B means not frequently used and C means not used. So, let us take two extreme cases here. These are the processes, various processes which we have just seen. These are the various materials that we have just seen. So, two previous slides here we are combining the two together. So, we can see we can have primary forming processes, deforming, material removal, joining and property changing processes. Let us take the case of metals A. So, we can see almost all are the A and what is the ranking for A? A means widely used. So, which means for metals most of the processes are well established and are being commercially used. Now, let us take the case of composites C, C, C and one more C here and one B here, B here, B here, only one A here and one A here, which means that our conventional processes which are well established for converting the metallic raw materials into the metallic products are very well established and are commercially being used. Whereas, all these processes cannot directly be duplicated in case of composite materials, which means that we need to look for advanced processes, new processes for making the composite materials. So, this way we can see that the product design when we are doing a new product design and we decide and we select a material for that product, we have to do all this analysis that which particular process will be used for making this product since it is being made by material X. So, for material X first we need to list down what are the processes that are possible whether these processes will be able to produce this product in the most efficient effective both from the feasibility point of view also from the cost effective point of view also. So, this diagram is very very important. So, we can very easily see and locate that which process is applicable to which type of material. So, for all product designers they can have a look at this type of databases, this type of information which is available and take their decisions more judiciously. So, that at the later stage there are no design iterations required when the product goes into manufacturing. So, we have to select our processes, we have to select our materials and there are standard guidelines for that and this uh, uh, matrix that we have seen in the previous slide we that can be clubbed as a process material matrix because the processes were there in the various columns, the materials were there in the different rows and there was a correlation between the two in terms of which for which material which process is widely used. So, each manufacturing process can be characterized by a set of attributes type of selection charts based on which we select the processes are easily available. So, process material matrix are there, process shape matrix is there, process mass bar chart is there, process selection thickness chart is there, process dimensional tolerance bar chart, process economic batch size chart. Now, what are the attributes which are written here? Set of attributes. Now, these attributes can be material as is given here shape, it can be mass of the material, it can be thickness achieved by a different processes, then the dimensional tolerance and the economic batch size or the number of parts that we want to produce. Now, these can be the attributes 
when we are designing our product that what is going to be the material, what is going to be the shape of our part, what is going to be the mass, thickness, dimensional tolerance, economic batch, size and accordingly then we have to see that which is the process which is satisfying all these set of attributes and accordingly we will select our process. So, this already we have covered in our session in the beginning of our course. Now, these are the maybe once we have selected the process for example, we select casting process then this type of information is available as you can see on your screen. So, the design guidelines for sand casting. So, we have seen these are the examples of designs showing the importance of maintaining uniform cross sections in casting to avoid hot spots and shrinkage cavities. This is a shrinkage cavity here, shrinkage cavity here. So, here we can see large volume of part is there. So, usually we try to maintain a uniform cross section. So, this is a good design where we are able to maintain a uniform cross section. So, we can avoid the shrinkage cavity here also there are chances of formation of shrinkage cavity. So, we can avoid these type of shrinkage cavities by maintaining a uniform cross section or by modifying the design also. So, here we can see if possible we can modify the design in such a way that the shrinkage cavity is avoided or we can place the cores here or modify, modify the design so that the shrinkage cavities are not formed. So, these type of guidelines are this is just an example to summarize what we have already covered. Now, these type of guidelines are there for sand casting, these can be there for other forms of casting also for example, investment casting or slush casting or CO2 mold casting. There are different types of casting routes and strategies and for each type of casting strategy there will be certain guidelines. So, a product designer when he or she is specifying maybe investment casting as the casting process for manufacturing the product must look at these kind of of guidelines while designing the product or while doing the detailed design of the product so that we do not face and or encounter problems during the manufacturing of our product which is manufactured by the process which has been specified by the designer. Similarly, we can see design guidelines uh, are available for die casting also in previous cases we can modify the design of our product to avoid the formation of shrinkage cavities. Similarly, in die casting also we can modify the design in order to avoid the defects. So, one of the guidelines is allow the generous radii at internal and external corner. So, we can see here there are sharp corners and here it is a rounded corner again sharp corner a rounded corner. So, this is maybe a better design as compared to this design. So, this is not recommended for die casting, this is recommended for die casting. Similarly, here also sharp corners are there, here there are radii provided a better design for the die casting point of view. Similarly, insert designs to prevent rotation and pull out. So, here we can see this threaded portion will avoid the rotation of this part when it is fixed in this part. Similarly, this type of in, uh, recess can help us to provide a locking arrangement uh, to avoid the rotation of the part. Insert with locally machined flat. So, this is a locally machined flat here. So, which will avoid the rotation of the part or movement of the part up and down. So, insert designs to prevent rotation and pull out. This in this case it is going to avoid the pull out and in this case it is going to avoid the rotation of the relative or the two members among each other. So, therefore, we can modify our designs so that they can be easily manufactured using the die casting process. Similar type there are maybe a long list of guidelines that do exist when we are designing the product we must take into account these guidelines. Similarly, we have discussed about the polymer processing also in polymer processing manufacturing process used with polymers to take advantage of the unique viscoelastic flow properties of the polymers. Now, compared with metals the flow stress is much lower, highly strain rate dependent, the viscosity is much higher and formability is much greater. So, this is basically different techniques are used extrusion, compression molding and injection molding. So, these are some of the design maybe in the previous slide just a summary that what are the important characteristics of the 
polymer processing techniques and we have seen injection molding, compression molding and these type of guidelines we have already covered for the polymer processing techniques. So, here we can see sharp corners are there, so it is a poor design. So, if we make this as a slanted corners or tapered transition of these corners, it is better design, but still here we see the cross section is different. So, gradual transition plus we are coring out this thickness, this extra thickness from here and then we are maintaining a uniform thickness across the length. So, this is the best design. Similarly, here we are seeing sharp corners are there. So, we are maintaining a uniform cross section by giving a radius here. So, when we are designing a plastic parts, we can take into account this type of guidelines so that our manufacturing becomes easier, faster and effective. Then we have also discussed the assembly processes. The assembly processes involve the proper placement and appropriate integration of more than one parts to manufacture a final component. I have already explained it with the help of a pen. Uh, so many assembly processes have to be included in the final manufacturing of the product or final assembly of the product. So, we have different types of joining. We have seen adhesive joining, mechanical joining, welding. Now, these are the design guidelines for welding. This is not recommended, lot of different distance between the two. So, this is better joint preparation here also lot of gap. So, maybe a better gap management here. So, this is recommended and these two are not recommended. Poor and good fit up of the weld joints. So, these also not only this, we have seen a lot many designs or design modifications suggested by the engineers and scientists which help us to make good joints. So, in our 6th and 7th week of discussion, we have already seen a lot of guidelines like this. Now, joining of thermoplastic, we can have different strategies for joining of thermoplastic. For joining of metals, we can use welding, riveting. In case of joining of thermoplastics, we can use processes like ultrasonic welding, vibration welding, spin welding, induction welding. So, few important welding processes used for thermoplastic welding are already listed here and we have already discussed them in detail in our discussion during 6th and 7th week. So, thermoplastics are generally joined by welding welding processes in which the part surfaces are melted allowing polymer chains to interdiffuse. So, basically how the surfaces are melted, the source of heat may vary and based on the source of heat, different processes are used. So, we can see that for metals there are specific set of processes and for polymers also there are specific set of processes and some of the processes can be used both for metals as well as for the polymers. Now, these are the design guidelines for vibration and spin welding. All of us know that when we are joining the two plastic parts and in the previous slide we have seen that there is a move, there is a melting of the plastic at the interface. So, there is a tendency of this plastic to move out as a flash when it is in the molten state and when we apply a certain amount of pressure. So, when under that pressure the molten plastic may come out at the edges and form a flash. Now, how to avoid the flash? This is the design modification. If we make the two edges to be joined here like this. So, the flash whatever is generated at the joint will move out, but will fill this section. Similarly, here additional flash is there. So, here we can see the flash that is formed in in this design is accumulated here, but this side we have no modification. So, the flash is coming out of the part. So, similarly, these are the with the dimensions that how much dimensions must be given in order to avoid the problem of flash. The special joint designs are required to contain the flash that is squeezed to the outside of the part during the joining process during the vibration or the spin welding. Then we have also discussed in our course the techniques for hole making in polymer matrix composites. So, we have seen there are different types of materials may be metals, ceramics, polymers, composites. So, for composites we have seen there are number of problems associated. So, for hole making techniques we have seen we can use woodpecker cycle backup plate can be put below the composite plate, helical feed method, ultrasonic assisted drilling. So, all these techniques are improvised version of the conventional drilling technique in order to avoid the drilling induced damage in composite materials. And this is just one technique, the drill goes down, then it comes up, it is shown here. Again, it goes down to a further depth, initially it, it goes down to this depth, then the depth increases, then again the depth increases 
so this down and up motion of the drill is the like the woodpecker makes a hole in the tree after each drilling cycle retract the drill out from the hole to ensure that no chips are stuck on to the drill and moreover the feed rate also be controlled in the subsequent steps which is a important cause of push down type of delamination that is the lower layers of the composite try to push down during the action of the drill so therefore this type of helical feed method can avoid the push down type of delamination when you are making holes or when you are drilling holes in case of laminated composite materials then towards the end of our discussion we have also seen the design for environment that whatever materials whatever processes we choose must be environment friendly so design for environment is a method to minimize or eliminate the environmental impacts of a product over its life cycle right from conceptualization of the idea to the end of life of the product finally to the recycling or disposal of product into the environment we must make a environmental impact assessment of the product at its various life cycle of at its various stages of the life cycle effective dfe practice maintains or improves product quality and cost while reducing the environmental impact so that is very very important we want to reduce the environmental impact of the product dfe expands the traditional manufacturers focus on the production and distribution of its products to a closed loop life cycle so this point already i have explained in the last or the eighth week of our discussion in session number 36 and session number 37 so we have seen that how the viewpoint of traditional manufacturer must change if he or she wants to be successful then we have also covered the concept of product architecture that when we have to design the product finally we need to design it as different modules because sometimes we may like to take advantage of the expertise of a particular company which has developed a particular module and that module can directly be integrated into our product so we can make our product into different modules and for some modules we can have the expertise and for other modules we can outsource them and to finally combine all the modules to finalize or fabricate or assemble our product so the arrangement of functional elements into physical chunks which become the building blocks for the product or uh, product or family of product so we can see overall product it can be divided into different modules module 1 module 2 module 3 module 4 so some of these modules we can try to develop some of these modules we can try to outsource so we have seen that what type of product architectures are usually in practice so the two of them are shown here we can have a modular architecture we can have an integral architecture so we will not be able to go into the details of this but in modular architecture each part box hitch fairing bed springs wheels are maybe independently satisfying a particular function or they are satisfying the functional requirement independently whereas in case of integral we can see that there is a interrelationship among the various parts the upper half lower half nose piece cargo hanging straps spring slot covers wheels so we have different parts of the product here this is a product so we there are different modules or different modules in the product but here there is a integral design so there is a interface among the various module and the functions that they are satisfying these are the functions that are satisfied and if you go back to the functional definition usually we use a very crisp two word functional definition that is verb and noun so here we can see minimize air drag connect to vehicle support cargo loads suspend trailer structure transfer loads to road so these are the functions which have to be satisfied by the product this is the product which is listed here and these are the various parts of the product so here in integral uh, product architecture we have inter relationships among the various uh, parts of the product and the various functions that are satisfied whereas in modular each and every module has got a very very specific function to be achieved so this also we have covered in our section in the discussion 
then we have also covered one session on rapid prototyping so rapid prototyping technologies are able to produce physical model in a layer by layer manner directly from the cad models without any tools dies and fixtures and also with little human intervention so most of the rapid prototyping processes are automatic in nature rp is capable to fabricate parts quickly with complex shapes easily as compared to the traditional manufacturing technology so whatever we are covering in today's session is a summary of what we have already covered in the 39 sessions which have already been recorded and are now available with you so we have tried to now focus on all the latest strategies and all the thought processes that a product designer must keep in mind when he or is designing a product so we have seen that we must focus on product architecture we must focus on the product design process we must focus on the product analysis we must focus on the design guidelines for various products that are being manufactured by the various processes so this is a amalgamation of all the various aspects that must be kept in mind during the product design process so that the design that we finalize is easily acceptable by the manufacturing community they are easy easily able to manufacture that product and then it finally becomes a profitable product in the market customers are happy to use that product because the functions for which they have bought the product are easily being satisfied without causing any trouble or any without requiring any trouble shooting so we have tried to cover all these topics in the course now let us take the case study so we have seen beginning from the design of the product then manufacturing analysis of the product then prototyping of the product we have uh, learnt that we can divide that complete product design into the various modules we can have a modular type of product architecture we can have an integral type of product architecture now once we have prototyped we have checked that now our product is ready it can be sent for manufacturing we can think of the benefits or savings that we can accrue and this case study is only to help you understand the magnitude of savings that we can get if we follow all the guidelines that we have covered in the previous session or in all the previous sessions so this this case study is taken from that book buthroyd duhurst and knight published in 1994 product design for manufacturing and assembly so example is this is original design for a thermal gun sight reticle in us tank made by texas instrument there are large number of fasteners here we can see large number of fasteners are there so when the company modified the design it was a modified design is again shown here redesigned thermal gun sight reticle simple to assemble and less to go wrong so you can see here we have less number of fasteners that are required the product design has been changed the number of processes required will also change the number of material required will also change as well as the type of processes that will be used to manufacture this product will also required to be changed so when the company launched a new design you can yourself see what are the improvements that have been achieved so the assembly time for the original design which was initially used was 2.15 in the redesign only 0.33 was the time units those were used so basically our target is to look at the improvement so the time as we can see in hours is written here 84.7% improvement is there in the assembly time number of different parts initially 24 different types of number of different parts were used now it is only reduced to 8 total number of parts initially 24 47 parts were there 24 different parts maybe one part may be in, used in two numbers or one part may be used in four numbers or six numbers total number of parts were 47 but finally the total number of parts were 12 only significant improvement total number of operations from 58 were reduced to 13 metal fabrication time from 12.63 hours to 3.65 hours weight 0.48 pounds to 0. 2645.8% so you can see 
lot of improvements are there only by modifying the design, by changing the design, by keeping a manufacturing focus on the design, by looking at the design from the manufacturing point of view, we can see the kind of improvements that have taken place. So friends, if we look at the designs that we have seen for various products around us and try to figure out that how this design can be modified without compromising with the functional scope of the product. We may come up with very very innovative designs and once we have the design ready with us, if we focus on that how it is going to be manufactured, what can be the best manufacturing process for this product, what can be the material that can be selected for this product, we can go to the rapid prototyping stage and once we are able to make a prototype very easily, we can lead that product or design into the actual full scale manufacturing. So with this we conclude our course on manufacturing guidelines for product design. In today's session we have summarized, we have given a manufacturing perspective about the product design that once we are designing the product where our focus must be or what is the kind of information that is available in the open domain which we must make use of while designing our products so that the products that we design are easy to manufacture manufacture, easy to assemble as well as once they are easy to manufacture and assemble, we have to also ensure that their maintainability, their serviceability is also easy, they are durable also, they are dependable also. So basically we have to look at a large number of factors when we are deciding the materials and the manufacturing processes that are going to be used for manufacturing of our products. I sincerely believe that the last 40 sessions that we have interacted will be useful to all of you and it will give you a new thought in the direction of combining or complementing your knowledge from the manufacturing as well as from the industrial engineering into a broad area of product design. So basically what we target is that we must create number of innovators, number of product designers so that we come up with designs of products which are going to satisfy the needs and requirements of our society. So I wish all the product designers a very very bright future and I wish the course must have been helpful to you in some form of value addition related to the combined effect of the two streams of P and I engineering that is the production as well as the industrial engineering. In case you have any doubts, you are most welcome to write at the discussion board. We will be more than happy to answer to all your queries. Thank you.